Hello, and welcome to What's New in Historical Fiction, a regular panel series featuring historical novelists with new and upcoming titles. Uh, we're so glad you can be here. Uh, my name is Colin Mustful. I'm the founder and editor of History Through Fiction, an independent press based in Minneapolis that publishes historical fiction. Uh, please take a moment to say hello in the chat. Just let us know where you're joining us from. Uh, just a couple quick things before we get going. Uh, I put together a landing page with our panelist books, and I'm going to post that in the chat, and that goes to, uh, you can see all of our panelist books, and they're linked to bookshop.org, and we support sales through bookshop.org because they give money back to independent booksellers, and they also uh, have an affiliate link, so when you buy one of our author's books through Bookshop, it also, uh, we get a small percentage ourselves, so we really appreciate that. Uh, thank you to everyone who made a contribution um, when you bought your ticket. It is a free event, um, but uh, I really appreciate those who made a small donation. It really helps pay to help us at History Through Fiction continue to use this Zoom platform and to offer these events. All right, without further notice, um, let's welcome our panelists. So, um, Martha, if you could say hello and tell us a little about yourself. Hi, I'm Martha Engber, and uh, this is the book I'm going to be uh, talking about tonight, uh, The Falcon, the Wolf, and the Hummingbird. Uh, I come from uh, California, but I was originally from uh, uh, Chicago, and my sisters uh, live in Connecticut, and that is where the uh, story is based, because I've spent so many years uh, traveling to Connecticut and the East Coast. And I, I got very interested in the history of uh, indigenous tribes there, uh, especially the Pequot Museum in Mashantucket, which is fabulous. And uh, so from that, I, um, I devised the story about two uh, Native American women warriors on opposing tribes during a very short, very heated conflict between the two. One is really big and one is really small. And it's a matter of which one is gonna win in a, a David and Goliath situation. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that is my book and I hope you will read it. It's from History of Books, by the way. Thank you, Martha. Yeah, I, I'm really looking forward to talking to you about that novel. Uh, Kathleen, if you could introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your book. Sure. Um, my name is Kathleen Jones, and the title of my book is Cities of Women. I am currently sitting in Los Angeles, California. However, I am a native New Yorker, grown up in Brooklyn, New York, currently living on the shoreline of Connecticut in Stonington, Connecticut. Uh, but my book isn't situated in any of those areas except for the California piece, where one of my protagonists, the modern woman, Verity Frazier, uh, is inspired by the medieval manuscripts to set out to prove that the artist responsible for illustrating the books of an actual historical figure, Christine de Pizan, who was a writer, was another woman named Anastasia. And so she travels to Europe, to London and Paris, to try to find clues big enough that she can establish what she expects, that Christine's books were illuminated or painted by another woman. Thank you, Kathleen. Uh, Linda, you. if you could say hello and let us know a little bit about your book. Sure. Hi, Colin. Hi, everyone. Um, so my book is right here, Bessie, um, that I will talk about uh, tonight. Uh, first, I just say that my name is Linda Cass. I live in the Columbus, Ohio area. Um, I grew up in Columbus. I didn't live there all my whole life, but um, I have been there for quite some time. And um, I began uh, as a, actually as a journalist uh, magazine and um, magazine journalist for regional national publications and switched to novel writing about 15 years ago. Um, this book, Bessie, is um, about Bess Meyerson. She was um, a musically talented uh, daughter of poor Russian immigrants and she was crowned Miss America um, just days after the end of World War II. Uh, really an um, improbable choice of a Jewish woman given the sentiment of bigotry in 1945. Um, 
her beauty and poise certainly played a role, but really she, it was her brilliance as a musician that probably captivated not just the audience, but the judges. Um, and she, I, in my book, I really focus um, on her early life, uh, based on a lot of biographical and historical um, information, um, just to uh, focus on a woman who later in life, which I didn't deal with her later life, but she became quite a consequential uh, woman who um, was active uh, certainly in the early days of television and then um, in politics, quite unusual for a mid 20th century um, woman. Uh, so she was she was uh, quite a trailblazer in many ways, and and uh, I was very interested to understand how someone like her became a beauty queen. Thank you, Linda. Yeah, that sounds fascinating, and, and I I'm not familiar with uh, Bess Meyerson, so I look forward to hearing you talk more about her. Uh, Carrie, if you could say hello and let us know about your novel. Hi, I'm Carrie Chappett, and. Um, I live in Bend, Oregon, which is a mountain town in the center of the state. And my recent novel that came out this summer is called Chasing Eleanor. And it's based off of Eleanor Roosevelt's visit to Bend in 1936. And I write, this is my fifth published novel. And I generally write um, young women protagonists. And my books always feature found family and a lot of action adventure and this book is no different um i it's actually my first young adult historical chasing eleanor is and it is based on uh, my character 17 year old magnolia parker and she her family basically falls apart in your typical great depression story and she has two sick little brothers who get taken away from her and they get sent to an unknown orphan asylum so she decides that she's going to get them back and her um only hope was a promise from Eleanor Roosevelt, who she met when she was working um, at a hotel in Bend. And so she sets off across the country to chase down Eleanor Roosevelt to try to put her family back together. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, well, let's go back to Martha. Um, Martha, can you start by telling us about the characters you use, Misha and Pino, in your um, novel, The Falcon, the Wolf, and the Hummingbird? The Hummingbird? So who are they and what, tell us about the circumstances of their lives and the, the journey they go on. Um, a tribe's in the uh, book and it's pre-colonial. So, uh, you know, before any any uh, immigrants come to the country uh, is, is loosely based on the tribes of the Narragansett, um, the Pequot, which was Southern Connecticut, and then the uh, Iroquois of, um, of Western Connecticut, uh, New York, uh, Lake Champlain area. And uh, so uh, Pino Timonluck is the um, protagonist, and she is from a tribe of, uh, called the Manituck, and they are uh, kind of based on the Pequot, which is a small, they had a very, um, the setup is that it's a, it's a small tribe, and it's surrounded by a very aggressive um, tribe um, called the Pagasset uh, on one side, and um, a very large and um, also aggressive tribe on their eastern border. And so uh, Pino is a 19-year-old. Um, By that time, of course, that's a full woman. She's, you know, been married, had a kid, and so forth. Um, but she's a brilliant strategist. And uh, the, as you know, the warfare is very important in this book. And, it, you know, the, the um, Native Americans just knew so much about how to use the terrain and their knowledge of the terrain uh, and but the, her issue is that she has never recovered from the trauma of of her her sister being murdered about ten years previous, and uh, she's she's essentially trying to um, by saving her tribe uh, redeem herself. And her opponent that she learns it turns out to be a uh, another female in the Pagasset uh, tribe who gains. Uh, uh, I guess it's a more traditional way of women uh, gain, uh, using influence by um, influencing uh, one of the um, chief's um, sons who is uh, um, uh, really taken with her. And so that's how she gains influence. But it's this, it's this, uh, the two of them learning about each other. And, and it, it's a very 
unusual, intense situation. And I, I assume that uh, in warfare, it would just, you know, that you would know your opponent because, just by the moves they make and where they go and what they do and the decisions. So it, it and she too is a near slave and so um, uh, is essentially trying to beat uh, um, uh, Pino uh, by virtue of, uh, and in, in so doing, gain her own freedom. So they both got a lot at stake. One losing the entire tribe, the other one losing her her, um, her, uh, her freedom for good. So um, that's the two. I love. And I'm just a I little love women characters. Yeah. <laughs> were Were you able to base them off of any one in particular that you found in a historical record, or or how did you come up with those characters? No, you know, um, there are uh, instances of uh, women warriors in, in uh, Native American culture, uh, and they could be um, uh, sachems and chiefs as well, it was, though it was, it was not as likely. Uh, in this case, um, I really based it on uh, the feeling I got one day when I was in Connecticut biking through the forest. And just have this feeling of the people who lived there originally, and they just this this female just quiet watching, you know. And so that's what I, so that's what I went from. Uh, that's fantastic. <laughs> uh, let's go to Kathleen. Uh, Kathleen, <laughs> you already talked a little bit about Christine de Pizan. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about her and how did you first become interested in studying <laughs> her and writing about her? Right. Christine de Pizan lived between uh, 1364, approximately, and 1430 in France, although she was born in Venice, Italy. And her father was an educated man in Italy. He was an advisor to the Doge, one of the leaders of Italy uh, in Venice. And the family moved to Paris, France, and he became, he was an astrologer, and he became an advisor to King Charles V. Christine, when she was 25 years old, was widowed and uh, distraught at the fact that she couldn't inherit her father, her husband's property. And she turned to writing in first poetry in order to express her sorrow, but eventually used her connections at the court through her father's network to be able to become uh, a very highly regarded and also highly maligned writer uh, who eventually supported herself with her writing and not only herself, but her three children and her mother. Uh, she became very influential in French politics and I first learned of her through her book of the City of Ladies, uh, which was one of the things she produced in 1405. And this is a period before uh, the printing press and all books were physical objects that were handmade. And she not only wrote these, uh, but sometimes transcribed them herself. Therefore, she wrote her own books and, uh, and also supervised their production in the medieval period. Uh, when I taught excerpts from her book to a group of university students in a course I was teaching at the time, I was amazed at how excited they became when they learned that a woman in the uh, 14th century had written such things about women, about other women, to basically correct the record. Because in her book of the City of Lad Ladies, she's expressing initially her despair at all the horrible things men have said about women. And she's visited by three uh, spirits, Lady Reason, Lady Rectitude, and Lady Justice. And they tell her to forget about all that, trust her own judgment, and with the trowel of her pen, rewrite history. So in a way, she's a kind of precursor to all of the revisions of women's stories that have come down to us uh, you know, from, from then till now. I became fascinated with the process of medieval book production. And I wanted to express, as since I'm a modern woman, I wanted to express the fascination, the obsession that someone could have about the first meeting with Christine's books and become convinced that another woman would have been part of her, let's call it production team or her writing workshop and paint these elaborate il illuminations in Christine's books. Yes, that's really amazing what she accomplished so many years ago. 
And I don't know if there's any connection, but yeah, I mean, that made me think of Dickens and A Christmas Carol with the Three Spirits. Right. Yeah. Um, it looks like uh, one of our attendees, Kim, she has a connection to Christine de Pizan and also to uh, Bess Meyerson. My mother-in-law was a runner-up to Miss America the year she won. So, Linda, um, if you could talk a little bit more about Bess Meyerson and what inspired you to write a book about her. Sure, Colin. Uh, Bess Meyerson was born in 1924. Um, she was a very unlikely um, uh, beauty queen uh, contestant, as I mentioned earlier. Um, she was she grew up poor. Her parents were Russian immigrants. They lived in the Bronx, and um, it was very important uh, for to her mother that her three daughters and Bess was the middle of three girls um, were were musicians. Um, she lived in a cooperative, one of the first cooperative apartments called Sholem Alechem uh, in the Bronx. And so many um, individuals who lived in um, this five building complex were from Eastern Europe. Many were musicians or artists. Um, this was really, uh, many of them were, were Jewish, as were the Meyersons, and, um, and, and this is how she grew up. She started taking piano lessons when she was nine, and she became quite a talented young musician. Um, her first foray out of the Bronx was um, at the age of 11 with a, with a music instructor who lived on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. And this woman, um, Dorothea LaFollette, became extremely influential in Bess's life, um, a mentor to her. Um, she, in fact, also encouraged um, Bess to apply to the very newly formed High School of Music and Art, which was um, really a brainchild of, and, and a passion of Mayor Fiorella LaGuardia's at that time. And so she entered the school as a 13 year old in 1937, which was the second year of this high school. Um, and it was for only the most talented um, graph, visual and, and um, mu musical uh, students in all five boroughs of New York City. Um, and it was there that she really blossomed um, and, um, and and also became more aware of the impending crisis going on in Europe, which was before you know the the preliminary before um, World War II actually began, uh, because this was 1937. And so while she was in high school, it was from 1937 to 1941, and um, and the war obviously we were attacked at Pearl Harbor 41, and she went to Hunter College four years, during the four years of World War II. Um, she uh, really, uh, through this book, and, and it's it's really her early life, I follow a decade of her life. I start when she's 12 years old. And the reason I do that is because Bess Meyerson was almost her, she was almost six feet tall. She was her adult height at age 12. And you can imagine how that must have felt to uh, a 12 year old girl. Um, and and she had she was very self-conscious, frankly, and very unconfident. Um, not again, your typical beauty queen, as you would think of someone who, as we all sort of those of us who knew Bess Meyerson, she was tall and graceful and beautiful and talented. And um, growing up, she was certainly, um, not that. Um, she sort of blossomed as a teenager. Um, she uh, really cared very much about, about her music and perhaps someday becoming either a soloist or a, a conductor. Um, but these things were really not open to women at that time. So um, through Bess Meyerson, I not only uh, focus on, on how she uh, grew up and 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 what the kinds of life the life she had, but also um, through her, I think the reader really sees mid twentieth century America, and um, it was filled, unfortunately, uh, with a lot of bigotry um, toward women, toward blacks, toward Jewish people, 
And so it was, uh, she was a very unlikely choice to become Miss America, frankly. And that made me quite curious about, about how that was um, and really why she even, um, you know, submitted an application to become a Miss America. And actually she didn't, her sister and uh, a friend uh, submitted uh, some photographs of her. And the only reason she really um, agreed to be in this contest was because it was the first year it had a $5,000 scholarship and she really wanted to go to Juilliard, <laughs> some musical academy. And, and, you know, she wanted to buy some things for her family, you know, um, and, and so she, she, uh, she got into this contest and it was, it was quite interesting as she ended up winning. Um, she, she really, uh, was, was their only college graduate and really a very, one of the most intelligent winners of, of this contest. And yet it was a beauty contest. And so the year <laughs> following her reign um, was a challenging year for her as well. And I get into that in the book. Um, so I cover 1936 when she's 12 to 1946 when she's 22 at the at following the year after her reign. Uh, Kim comments that her mother-in-law's Talent was packing a suitcase. So what what was Bess's talent? <laughs> well, as I said, she was a piano prodigy. Yes. <laughs> and she actually also at the High School of Music and Art, Colin, they were required to take up a second instrument if you, they were a music student. So she took up the flute. So mm -hmm. she played a um in the in the uh talent in the competition that year, she not only um played a, a, a beautiful um, uh, uh, arrangement of um, a Norwegian um, pianist, a composer, Edward Grieg. She also played Summertime, a Gershwin piece on her flute uh, mm -hmm. for the talent competition. Wow. Well, Carrie, let's go to you. I know you've been waiting patiently over there. Uh, tell, us about okay. your, tell us about your main characters, Magnolia, Hop, and Red. Uh, how did you get to know them as you were putting them down on the page? Well, um, a lot of revisions. <laughs> how I got <laughs> to know them. Um, uh, Magnolia was a challenge for me to write. Seventeen-year-old. Um, she's kind of tough as nails, but really um, has a huge heart, and she loves her brothers, and she just wants to protect them and save them because her. Um, her mother dies in the opening of the book and her father is taken off and <clears throat> she feels very responsible for um, keeping her family together. And, you know, it's that typical eldest daughter syndrome of um, they, they're responsible. They take on what the parents sort of failed to do. And, um, and so she thinks she's, once she gets control of this family, it's all going to be different. She's going to get a job. They can go back to school. Um, and of course, that is not how it goes. <laughs> sort of her her youthful uh, ignorance in a really lovely way um, led her to believe that she was going to be able to do better than her parents and everything kind of falls apart. And I just really loved the idea of having, telling about Eleanor Roosevelt in not a um you know biographical way in a young person looking up to Eleanor the way that I looked up to Eleanor growing up I have always admired her she's my favorite historical figure and I thought what a great way to introduce readers to Eleanor Roosevelt and all of her incredible accomplishments through the eyes of a sort of struggling 17 year old and she looks at Eleanor as this um role model and sort of the mother that she doesn't have anymore and in a lot of ways she reads uh everything that Eleanor Roosevelt wrote so Eleanor actually I mean her the list of things that she has done as accomplishments are amazing but she actually made more as a writer than her husband made as president um during those <laughs> years and so she's just really an incredible woman and so Magnolia looks up to her reads everything about her and kind of is on this cross-country chase riding the rails and everything yes to find her brothers but of course it is um in part to find herself and forgive herself and 
sort of let go and move on and start to live her own life. And um, in the process of writing this, you know, as characters do, they just sort of like push their way in and you go, okay, I guess you're in this now. And um, I think because I don't outline and I don't plot, I just sort of write what comes to me at the, at the time, which is why I do a lot of revisions. Um, what happened was I took all of these historical facts and the stories that I read about in memoirs and they all kind of joined together in these young people. And they sort of presented themselves in the story. And um, a lot like Red is a 14 year old a young girl who has a really traumatic past. And I don't, didn't want to bring that to in the center of the book because it's pretty awful. So I wanted it to be in the backstory, but it was part of a memoir that I wrote, um, I wrote, sorry, memoir that I read where all of these um, people talked about their stories from the Great Depression and riding the rails and the things that they encountered. And this one man had said it was the saddest thing that he had heard. And so I had that be her backstory. And Hop is an orphan who is um, just doing migrant work and traveling on the rails as uh, many, many young men did. And they form a little family and through all of their shared trauma and difficult backstories, they, they teach each other how to kind of trust again and move forward. I, I think that's just such a wonderful angle, a way to commemorate um, um, Eleanor Roosevelt and kind of inspire other, you know, young readers in a way that you you were inspired. Uh, well, I'm I'm going to go around and ask some more question uh, questions of our panelists, um, but we will go to questions from the audience a little bit later. Uh, we already got one from Edie, so maybe we'll get to that a little bit later, Edie. Um, I do want to post the link to the landing page. If any of these novels pique your interest, um, just head to that landing page and you'll find buy links there. Uh, let's go back to Martha. Uh, Martha, you already talked about this a little bit, um, but I was really curious about the challenges of writing a pre-colonial narrative in in this in the in the Western Hemisphere. I've I've written numerous novels that are you know have to do with the conflicts between the white settlers and the native people. So um, what inspired you to, to go that far back? And what were some of the challenges of doing the research and, and creating an authentic uh, historical novel set in pre-colonial America? Um, it was uh, an odd thing. It, it's just, I didn't want any white people in it. It's a very <laughs> odd thing to say. But I wanted to start before that because most of the, of course, that you have some fabulous uh, Native American authors who write so well about um, about uh, the conflicts with uh, uh, colonialists and you know that from from that moving forward. And when I was thinking about the tribes, um, I, they when you when there isn't that presence of this colonial power, they there was that breath to see how they existed with one another. And that was fascinating. Uh, it was before horses, for example, so they primarily used dugouts and they were fantastic uh, long distance runners because that's the best way to go. And they could run those forests, you know, they could do a marathon a day if they needed to. And it was uh, amazing. Uh, and uh, so I, I didn't want to have that um, as, uh, um, as a distraction, I guess. And uh, one of the ways to uh, research it is through the, the um, I, I it was what started, I started this probably about 20, 22 years ago or so. And the research is always, and this is probably true for all of us, the research is like one of the best reasons to, to write historical fiction because it's so enlightening all along the way. So I was reading books and maps and, you know, getting anything I, I could because it wasn't really easy. It was not all on the internet. And, but um, going, as I mentioned before, going to the Mashantucket Pequot um, Museum and Research Center in uh, Southern Connecticut was a fabulous resource. They had, uh, they have a living village that shows the, um, the uh, 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 in detail, the uh, tools and the, the, you know, it's like people walking around, except they're, of course, uh, models. And uh, so that was wonderful and then they also uh looked in the maps and that was really fascinating you get to hold the maps that um 
uh, first uh, um, trappers and so forth came and made. And it, it's a very interesting experience to, to see that. And the surprising thing was how many uh, Native American tribes there were in that area. It was kind of crowded, you know, and so that, you know, and there was, it's not surprising that there were definitely a lot of conflicts about territory and such. And um, so, uh, you know, that's the reason I, I said it as I did. So 20, 22 years. I just love the terrain. I guess I just love the terrain of Southern Connecticut. It's rolling. It's it, it's got up mountains. It's got ridges. It's got salt marshes. It's just, you know, I really fell in love with the uh, the the land. I'm I'm sorry. You you said it's been you 22 years of research. I know. Well, wow. you know, I obviously stopped researching a while ago, but it was uh yeah, I started it about 22 years ago. I, I you know, so it's. Uh, well, congratulations on being, you yeah. know, making it to this this point. Yeah, it was very interesting. Uh, Kathleen, um, if you could talk a little bit more about Christine, I I'm specifically um, curious to know more about the role of women in medieval society. You talked about some of the challenges that she faced. Um, so what, what position were women in? And also, why do you think it's important to, to shed light on someone like Christine de Pizan's accomplishments now? Yeah, uh, in many ways, we have a tendency to think that the you know, medieval period was nothing but the dark ages, uh, and that there's a natural progress from then to now, and that women have continued to improve their situation, opportunities, and so forth. And actually, that's not necessarily the case. And in, in some cases, women had many opportunities for productive roles outside of the home, let's put it that way. Uh, although there were an expectations that women would be married and ha you know, have duties in the family, they also played a very active role in the community in many arenas, whether it was uh, as owners of inns or as um, you know, runners of farms or any of a number of activities, they were very, very vital to the productive economy at the time. Uh, and probably the higher up the class you went, the more idle you found women, which is what makes Christine de Pizan so interesting because it was her father who really encouraged her education. Her mother really discouraged it. And I actually explore that in the novel, uh, in scenes when Christine is a young girl, very eager to continue the educational path that her father's encouraged her to pursue. And one of the real reasons is uh, uh, somebody I know commented in the chat, which is that I think she's really one of the first feminist writers in Europe. Uh, she definitely says many things to set the record straight and supports women's education. But it's not only that, her influence at the court of Charles VI at the time, when most of her publications were, were the most prominent, uh, was astonishing. She really was an active participant in uh, influencer, you might say, in many of the political divisions at the time. And the fact that a woman who at the age of 25 is widowed, has three children and her mother to support, and is left really without much in the way of economic means, as I mentioned, she couldn't inherit her husband's property, uh, figures out how not only to survive, but to be overcome any of the obstacles and to become really a publisher in her own right. And that's another thing. In the book trade at the time, and Paris was the center, uh, one of the centers of the book trade, well, uh, women were very, very active as in all aspects of that trade, whether it was parchment making or as scribes or as artists themselves. And I really wanted to bring that to the foreground so that we're really aware of uh, the contributions that women have made and the incredible legacy of Christine de Pizan from that period, from the 15th century all the way now. I mean, if you read the Book of the City of Ladies and you think of the many, many contemporary novels that have come out just within the last few years that are revisions of say ancient Greek myths, you can find precursors to all of that in Christine de Pizan's Book of the City of Ladies, but she also wrote military uh, treatises, uh, she wrote poetry, and so the range of her influence, uh, which sort of went out of, of knowledge for a while when, uh, uh, you know, by around the, say, 17th century, we hadn't heard much of her. And in fact, in English, 
uh, there was a lapse of some 400 years between the English, the first English translation of her works, which took place in, I think, 1521, to when uh, Earl Geoffrey Rich Richards came out with a new translation into English of the medieval French, and, and that was in uh, the 1980s. So we had this gap in uh, uh, availability of, of her books in, in English for a very long period of time. I'd say, yeah, it's a long time. <laughs> Uh, well, Linda, I, I wonder if you could talk about the dichotomy that Bess, Bess Meyerson faced. On the one hand, she had this vibrant Jewish community that she grew up with. On the other hand, she faced all the kinds of anti-Semitism in 1940s America. Can you talk about that dichotomy that she had, that she was challenged with? Yes, yes. Um, she... Um... Throughout this, uh, well, while she was in the Bronx, she was it was a very insular, you know, upbringing, and she, she she was pretty much insulated from the more secular world. And as she went out, uh, began her piano lessons and her journey to the Upper West Side, and then to the High School of Music and Art, and then to Hunter College, um, she increasingly, you know, was was you know around uh, others. Her, the 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 most anti-Semitism that she really faced uh, came when she entered that uh, Miss America pageant. Um, she was asked to change her name mm. by the pageant director, um, and there's a, a scene in 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 my novel um, where I bring that sort of to life um, because you know she at first was asked, you know, well, change it. And she thought to herself, yeah, there's some actors and, and others, uh, well-known individuals who have changed their, their ethnic sounding names. But as she then started thinking about it, she realized that if she won her family, her friends, her campers, because she was a counselor at a camp every summer that she was in college, they wouldn't know it was her. And so she wanted to keep her name. And when you think about it, it was kind of courageous for her to just sort of stand up to the, really to the executive director of the pageant, who was a very strong Southern woman, uh, you know, just, um, much, you know, much older than, than, than Bess, My Bess Meyerson was. And to, I call it Bessie because she was known as Bessie by her friends and family as she was growing up. But then as she, um, uh, went on to uh, her in her reign. Um, there were there were circumstances that she had to face as well, um, where at one point she was somewhere in the south and um, was to uh, give a talk at some country club. And as she started descending the stairs in a, in a gown, you know, and ready to perform her piano piece. Um, overheard the host tell her chaperone that this is a, a club we don't allow Jewish members we don't allow Jewish people at this club so we are not going to hear from her you know and and so she had that kind of discrimination and she also saw a lot of discrimination of others and particularly bothersome to her was the discriminate the racism that she saw around her um and and she spoke against that and what was really um, inspiring about her in her early life. And certainly she became a consequential woman later in her life, a part of her life that I just deal with quickly in an epilogue because I'm really focused on her sort of coming of age, whatever you want to call it, the, the her moral and, and psychological development as a as a young young girl into a young adult. Um, she she is really um, someone who uh, really becomes a, a consequential at her reign when she um, meets the an executive with the Anti Defamation League, and they have they assign her. She joins with them to be a spokesperson for what is called their Brotherhood campaign, a fight against really racism, um, and and to build tolerance. And she spoke 
across the country, everywhere, high schools, any kind of organizations. And she became their spokesman. And, and they, they tagged it because she had been Miss America. They tagged it, you can't be beautiful and hate. So it was really interesting also that here, this is 1946, the year of her reign. She won in 1945. Um, but so 1946, she's, um, you know, she's, she's, you know, cascading the country. And fighting hate. And it's, you know, we see today so much relevant kinds of sentiment that, um, that we're, we're trying to, you know, deal with now. So, um, she, she was, she, she became consequential then. And actually through her life later on, she never left her advocacy, um, of, and work with the ADL along with a lot of other, a lot of other things. Bess Meyerson became a, a trailblazer a pioneer in the television industry. Um, I, people might have met, remembered her on a game panel show, which was what was so popular in the fifties and sixties. Uh, I've got a secret. Um, but then she, mm. um, also, um, it became very uh, well known in New York City um, government. She she served under Mayor Lindsay as the Commissioner of Consumer Affairs very successfully. She she served under Mayor Koch as the um, uh, Commissioner of Cultural Affairs, um, with a great impact on expanding cultural opportunities in the city. So she she really you know went on as a woman in mid century. Um, mid 20th century to do quite a few things and and continue to advocate um and become an activist uh for uh tolerance for um cultural affairs for consumer affairs and whatnot so um that was quite inspiring for me yeah definitely just an amazing life and how how great that yeah. she was able to use that platform for such positivity Carrie, um, let's go to you. I wanted to ask you about writing um, a novel set in the uh, Great Depression. So what was it like for you researching that time period and bringing it to life? Was it anything anything that was, you know, because we hear about it in textbooks, but then to really put yourself in the shoes of someone experiencing that, what was that like for you? Well, the Great Depression is my favorite uh, time period to read about. And so like you said, we don't always see novels on the bookshelves set in the Great Depression. So when I do, I just, you know, grab them. I love them. Um, and I had finished um, Kristen Hanna's The Four Winds came out, um, I think right when I was finishing up edits. Mm -hmm. And, and um, you know, she did a really beautiful job of discussing the Dust Bowl and everything. And um, it was, it's always so sad uh, to hear these stories of just, you know, desperation, really. Um, and so I needed there to be some light at the end. I needed there to be this hope. And that's where Eleanor Roosevelt came in because, you know, she's a very small part of the story. They have a chance encounter in the opening of the book in the first, like, three chapters. And then she's chasing her like a dream, sort of. And so she is this positive... Um, overly hopeful thing in her world um and I liked that because the stuff that they were dealing with was really really hard but on the other hand I think this is really what draws me to historical fiction is when you drop people in the worst of times when you talk about the great depression you strip everything from people their homes their livelihood their status their material possessions. When you take away everything, who are you? And that's really the question of the Great Depression and why I'm very interested to read about it. Um, and what's really fascinating is that you hear story after story after story um, of people talking about how really truly heartbreaking that time was, but it allowed the best of humanity to rise to the surface. People who had nothing were giving away quarter sandwiches to people at their back door um, the people who had the least were giving the most and I think I tried really hard to lean into that positivity because it otherwise you're just like raking through hopelessness I think is what one of my reviewers said and I'm like I know it was the great depression um it was very <laughs> hopeless um so yes I it was it was 
sad to read these stories, but also hopeful in a way because we are very, um, I don't know, we're very into our material world as a modern society. And then you think about, as we all do when we read fiction, what would I do if I was in this situation? And we really don't know, but it's a very interesting idea that if everything that you had right now was stripped away from you and you had to protect your family, what would you do? Um, and so that's why I like action adventure as well. And why this ended up being YA it didn't start out as YA. It started out just as adult historical fiction, but all of these younger characters sort of pushed their way in. I, I think that that was important because they still had hope and grit and fight um, to get through this hard time. And that's such a wonderful way to look at it, that it, it really brings out who you are. And I'm, I mean, that's perfect for, for a fiction novel and getting to know characters and having the reader be able to to relate to those characters. Uh, so we've got a couple questions in the chat. If anyone has a question, go ahead and post that in there and I'll get to as many as I can. Um, a little bit earlier, Edie asked, and I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong, uh, asked about your research. Like, do you enjoy the research? And I know we already heard from Martha a little bit about that. But then Ryan also asks about research rabbit holes and whether or not some of the research you did um, didn't make it into your novel. So uh, Kathleen, could you just tell us a little bit about your research and was there anything that, that you wanted to get in there that just didn't fit the narrative? Yes. Uh, I spent, uh, I suppose this research has been going on for me for more than 10, maybe 15 years on and off. Not that I've been working on the book that long, but I've certainly been involved in researching this period. And um, as, a core, as a consequence of that, very exciting for me, and in fact, a temptation that I have to resist because having had an academic career and taught at the university for so many uh, you know, decades, it, research is sort of your, your middle name. And I wanted to get to writing the novel. And one of the rabbit holes that I fell down was in relation to Christine de Pizan's early life when she was born in Venice. I started to research a lot about women's lives in Venice at the time and created an entire uh, character and a whole bunch of scenes that expanded out to two or three chapters, including work on um, what was going on in the in, in uh, the sex trade industry and prostitution in Venice. And interestingly enough, the city rulers decided at some point in the 14th century to enable women to become the brothel owners because men were so corrupt at that task. And that seemed to be really fascinating to me. So I, I wrote two <laughs> or three chapters <laughs> which explored that. And then I had to ask myself, what's that got to do with the story? Um, because after all, I haven't even talked about the, the main character from this period, this medieval period, isn't actually Christine de Pizan, but it's the painter, Anastasia, who brings Christine's stories to life through her painting. And so as much as I was getting excited about the research discoveries I was making, uh, um, the, the mentor I was working with at the time said to me, you know, what has that got to do with the story? And painful as it was, I had to eliminate those chapters and all of that research and move on. Kathleen, I think you need to write your next book about female brothel owners. <laughs> I want to read that. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Linda, I know you you talked a lot about you know, some things you were able to include in maybe the epilogue. So were there parts that you really wanted to get into the narrative that you just couldn't? Uh, <clears throat> well, I, I I think that in this case, um, I I did my research. I read these. I started with biographies of Bess Meyerson. And, and frankly, when I first read these biographies of hers, um, you know, I hadn't committed that I was going to, you know, write a fictional um, portrait of her early life at that point. I just was curious uh, to take it back a, a step here. I um, I was very aware of Bess Meyerson. I was aware uh, that she was Miss America, that she became kind of an iconic figure later in her life. Um, but I read something in early 2020 um, in an article uh, about Miss America contest, and inevitably they would always mention Bess Meyerson in these in these uh, articles. And what struck me had to do with the fact of the year of when she got this, you know, she was crowned that that it was literally six days after the close of World War II. 
Um, and I had previously written two novels and they were set in, in World War II and part of one was set during, in New York too. So I was aware of how unlikely that she, a Jewish woman, you know, would win Miss America at that time period. So that's what drew me to suddenly read these biographies. So when I started reading biographies, that was my initial research. I read three different biographies and I am most attracted to the early life. And there was a whole lot of stuff I knew about her later life. Um, much of it very good because of the impact she made on television later in politics in New York. She even ran unsuccessfully for the Senate. Um, but then also the, some personal choices she made got her you know, in a little hot water during a um, uh, later part of her life. And I really wasn't interested in going there. So maybe that rabbit hole I didn't jump into. <laughs> I, I got an understanding of the basic outline of her later life, of the consequential woman she was. But I really knew I wanted to focus on her early life. So I then ended up very fortunately doing research on the areas in the biography, I knew there were touch points and I kind of identified what those were in her life. And I was able to, and, and, and all of us who write historical fiction love research. So <laughs> I was able to um, find books, for example, a book on um, New York during World War II. I actually lived in New York during the 80s and when Bess Meyerson was um, commissioner of um, uh, cultural affairs under Mayor Koch, but I had no idea what New York City in 1945 or 1940 was like. And so having a book that spanned all these years in great detail, and believe me, it was far more detail than I could have possibly used in, in, a, in a novel, but it did give you the substance uh, to, to create a real verisimilitude of New York City at that time when she was there. Um, but I came across another book uh, just serendipitously at the library of um, written by the first principal of this high school she went to, you know, mm -hmm. so to, to be able to really read a whole book about everything about this high school, where it was, what the classes were like, you know, what requirements they had of students, the school newspaper even, you know, I, I was able to actually inhabit her and be, you know, being in this high school because of that book. Um, so I found equally just different books like this. There was one on Hunter College. There was a Miss America book that I found. Um, and then along with these three biographies, but really one was really the best biography because it um, it used Bess Meyerson herself in sections of it so I could hear her voice and I could get a sense of her and her values um, through her voice. Um, that helped me a lot too. So I kind of knew these touch points. So I, I kept myself from going down that <laughs> route. <laughs> that that does happen trust me and it has happened to me before yeah it sounds like it's hard for you to draw the line and say no i gotta start writing mm -hmm. <laughs> carrie anything interesting in your research process for this novel yeah um <clears throat> i was very sad to have to cut out a scene that i wrote but same reason as kathleen I went, there is absolutely no reason to have this in there but i really <laughs> wanted it because um, back in the Great Depression, um, so I, Bend is a, it was a milling town, right? So we had, we have this river that runs through the center of town. It's a huge part of our lives. Spend a lot of time on it in the summer. We walk along in the winter, you know, and so going back to the Great Depression and, and learning more about the river and the mills and all that, I found out that they had a water pageant. Um, and I thought, well, that is amazing. I need to know about that. And I went to my local um, his historical museum and they have a whole setup with pictures. And so they built, during the Great Depression, they built these huge swan floats and they had princes <laughs> and princesses and gowns and they would parade down the river. 
And I thought, well, that's amazing. First of all, we need to bring that back. Um, and second of all, I need to write that. And so I did all this research about how they used muslin to create these swans and what they built them out of. <laughs> I wrote the scene and when I went through edits, I went, there is no reason to have this in there. Other, it was it felt indulgent to me just because I wanted to imagine myself back in that water pageant. So I have Magnolia mention it in the, I think the second chapter um, and it pained me to have to get rid of that scene. <laughs> That was fun to write, at least. <laughs> it was, and I always have it in my file for me. Well, Martha, I don't want to leave you out. Um, did you have any issues like organizing your research after doing so many years of it? Oh, I'm a major planner and organizer, so you really <laughs> need that. I guess all of you have that same uh, same uh, talent, uh, because without it, you're just a goner. You're never going to find all the facts and and that you really want to draw on when the time comes. And um, I think I used, uh, I, I, I don't even know how many resources I've got, hundreds. Uh, and um, probably one of them, I didn't really go down any rabbit holes because I had to essentially research everything. Everything had to be researched, the mode of transportation, what they ate and planted in, in the, the substance of their clothes and uh, the way they would communicate from tribe to tribe, right? It, it was awesome. Uh, often used um, symbols on trees as well as uh, hand, uh, hand signs. Uh, and uh, so it was just very interesting. And probably one of the most interesting things was I finally eventually um, uh, found something on YouTube uh, that was a woman doing bird calls. Now you hear bird calls are a big part of the story because they it's a you know a um, subtle way of being able to communicate with one another uh, in tight spots, uh, especially if the enemy is nearby. Um, and you hear about it that people would be able to make these really good bird songs. But I found this woman on YouTube, and it was crazy. It was crazy. It's like she opened her mouth and there was some, you knew that some bird recording was coming out. It, it could possibly <laughs> be this human person making this sound. And uh, so that was really, you know, really fascinating. You really see the, uh, it just, just efficient and clever and, you know, not wasting anything. It was really, really an amazing. Yeah, definitely. And and you make a, a great point about all the, the intricacies of that are required to write a historical novel and do the research, mm -hmm. not just on the, the, the major facts that are written down, but on all the, those small, tiny details. Well, we're coming up on the end of the hour here, on the end of our event. Um, this has been a really awesome panel. It has just flown by. Um, I'm going to remind our attendees that if they want to pick up any one of your books, we encourage you to go to bookshop.org and I put links to that um, in the chat there to pick up the books. I always want to, I always like, oh, and I want to mention too that our next panel is going to be October 29th at noon. It's a Sunday. I don't have the link prepared for that yet, but um, just follow us on Eventbrite and that'll keep you up to date on all the events that History Through Fiction is hosting. Um, yeah, I like to end our panels with a question about the value of historical fiction, because as we've just been talking about, all of you done, have done a bunch of research. I think two of you, maybe more, are journalists. I know, Kathleen, you're an academic. Uh, mm -hmm. So you, you didn't have to write fiction. You could have write, written something nonfiction, something journalistic. Um, so Kathleen, why don't we start with you? What's the value of historical fiction and why tell this story through fiction? Um, I think because... <laughs> The way you can create character and bring people into a story is so very, very different from, I mean, certainly the kind of academic writing that I'd been trained to do. Uh, it's the emotional resonance. It's the, the, the empathetic connection that you can make to not only the people and the times, but even the setting. Uh, and I think for me, it was the ability to, to really create something that had, uh, that engaged multiple senses. Uh, that excited me so much about fiction and really to let my imagination create an entire world around one sentence that appeared in the book of The City of Ladies by Christine de Pizan, where she mentions just the name Anastasia. We don't even know if she was real or just uh, an allegory. And, and I could create an entire 
story of someone around that based on what I knew about the times or learned about the times, but bring it to life. I mean, just to really bring people to a much closer connection to the past. I think you do that uh, more viscerally through fiction. Yeah, yeah, deeper visceral connection. I like that. Uh, Martha, why did you choose historical fiction to tell this story? It's um, uh, the two things that you're always looking for is to actually um, really, uh, uh, it, when you get involved in the characters, um, you realize exactly how much all people across all time have in common. It's mm. much more in common than there are differences. They become just people in really hard circumstances. And, uh, and that was fascinating as well as, and then the second thing, of course, is to, um, to really learn how things operate. Uh, I happen to be reading an Alan First uh, novel about the Balkans, and I like finally understand the Balkans and <laughs> their reports <laughs> in World War II. And it's not anything that can be possibly conveyed through a history class. It just it just can't. When you see people, you know, uh, negotiating the borders and or uh, you know the, uh, struggling with the weapons they've got or or the how they're feeling about their enemies or whatnot, that really brings it into uh, uh, you really do understand the the terrible stressors of that time and uh you know so those those two things how common we all are and how cool it is to find out about times that we were not there yeah yeah story helps us learn in such a unique way uh carrie she uh, martha mentioned you know, bringing out the people through difficult times and you talked about that a little bit so um why don't you what do you think about uh why you chose historical fiction to tell your story? Well, <clears throat> I, uh, growing up, I was raised um, by a U.S. history teacher. My dad was a U.S. history <laughs> teacher. And back in the 80s, when you could do this, he used to have his honors class in our living room. And so as a kid, <laughs> I was hiding behind the couch listening to high schoolers debate history, right? So history came alive for me. It was a living, breathing thing my whole life. Um, and it, be, it was kind of exciting to me. But I was seven or eight years old thinking to myself, were there no women in history? Because <laughs> we're only talking about men from a very young age. I was aware that we were only talking about men. And um, so I think what's really fascinating to me, and I love this panel because we're very... Um, female-centered and women empowerment, which is, you know, it's one of the main reasons that I write. And um, I actually have a series on TikTok called Badass Women in History. And it's all because of this, <laughs> because there were women all along that were doing amazing, strong, just powerful things that we were never taught. And the history books don't include, and they were forgotten. And history was rewritten from the lens of the white male and so for me what it does is give young women the knowledge that we've always done powerful things and you can too right on yeah <laughs> yeah Carrie, i know i follow you on several social media channels i can picture your little icon but i don't know yeah. if i follow you on tiktok what is your what is your handle on tiktok it is it's carrie writes i I think I'm pretty sure I follow you on okay. TikTok. I'll check. Uh, Linda, um, so uh, why why do historical fiction? What is the value that you think for for you in telling your stories? Well, I think so much has been said. I don't want to repeat it. I think the most important thing is to create witnesses. You know, mm -hmm. we need to remember these these women, these and these stories, um, and and we can do that. Um, but in terms of fiction, historical fiction, the reason to do that is so that we can create human beings on the page, so people mm -hmm. can actually understand this the, the individuals come alive in fiction you know where you're able to put them in a setting in a context talking with in a scene um and they became they become as as uh, uh i think kathleen had mentioned you know you you're engaging with them so um it is it's to put a human being on the page i think most importantly well i want to 
special thanks to all of our panelists today. Congratulations on your books. Thank you to all the attendees. Um, I think this has been a really wonderful discussion, and I'm so glad that we we're able to have it. And uh, that'll that'll end our event tonight. So thanks again for joining us, and have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.